All right, with part one of the nervous system, we took a look at the nervous system and got ourselves looking at the neuron and how it operates and got those graded potentials to get us down to um, triggering the action potential. So the second part, we'll look at how the action potential travels down the axon, what processes take place to move that electrical signal down those long axons, and then we will look at what happens at the end, at the term, uh, synaptic terminals, where we get the changing from an electrical signal into the chemical signal, where we get release of the neurotransmitter. And finally, we'll look at some of the bigger known neurotransmitters and their effects um, in the nervous system. All right, so we've gotten here, we've gotten to where we have Gone to negative 55 millivolts. All right, at that negative 55, at that axon HELOC, what do we find here? We have those voltage gated sodium channels. So once we hit negative 55, boom, that is going to trigger these voltage gated sodium channels to open. And that's going to cue our action potential okay and as you see our action potential looking here if we recording all right we can see let's go through our little steps negative 70 millivolts i'm just going to introduce this concept and then we're going to go in detail of it but we have a voltage gated channel for sodium And remember, sodium is high outside, and sodium is low inside. Okay. And then we have our, what we call our voltage-gated potassium channels. Okay. Potassium is high inside and low outside. All right, and we went through, we talked about how if we open these channels, what's going to change, how's our membrane potential going to change. And we saw with sodium, right, if sodium channels, if there's a lot of voltage-gated sodium channels and all these channels open up, sodium is going to be able to rush in. And what does it bring with it? It brings its positive charge. All right, so that is going, if sodium channels open, we change the permeability of sodium this number is going to become more positive on the opposite end of the spectrum if we open up a lot a voltage gated potassium channels then our potassium is going to rush out taking with it its positive charge and this would bring this to say a more negative number negative 80 millivolts okay so that's all we're going to be doing in doing our action potential. If we allow sodium to rush in, sodium can rush in and move down the axon. What is an electrical current? Electrical current is movement of charge. And if we open up a bunch of channels, we are bringing in sodium and moving it down the axon. So we are creating this electrical signal. Okay. And as you can see, what's going to happen first in our action potential is we have a large depolarization so you should think what's going to happen first is we're going to have voltage gated channels opening voltage gated sodium channels sorry and then we have a repolarization and hyperpolarization what's going to bring our membrane potential more negative you can think voltage gated potassium channels opening Okay, so it's just going to be the symphony of opening of channels that are going to move our action potential, create our action potential and move it down. And we'll talk about how it moves down the axon, do what we call propagate down the axon. All right, so that's the basics. It's where we're going, headed towards, but let's look at the kind of the more gory details of this and see how it is operating.
the other thing, if you remember, difference from an action potential to a graded potential is when you record here, you see the strength of the action potential, the amplitude. Right, and record further down the axon. Say this is three feet. This is one of those long axons, three feet down. You can see that the strength is the same. We do not lose signal over these long distances. Where the graded, this is a graded potential. It would, if we were recording down here, it would probably actually be almost nothing. It would be much, much smaller. Because remember those graded, we lose our strength as we move through the cell. Okay. All right. The other key concept of the action potential is it is all or none. Okay. Say here's our axon. Here's our axon HELOC. All right. And if we were recording our action potential, let's say we hit negative 55, right? That is our threshold. That is going to trigger our action potential. If we were recording this, say that's our action potential. What if we reached positive 10 millivolts? We had this larger change in membrane potential. We had a lot of excitatory signals and we got our membrane potential at the trigger zone. Here, what would my action potential look like? So I may say larger. It is the same. That is the all or non phenomenon. And that doesn't matter. Once I hit threshold all those voltage gated sodium channels are opening and basically it's like a switch either the a light switch either the action potential is on all the way or it's off there is no dimmer switch for your action potential so no matter what we reach here the strength of the action potential is going to be same amplitude Okay, and also as we move down, right, it's the same amplitude because we don't lose strength as we move through the cell. Okay, but all or none means that once we hit here, it is on. We hit anything above this, it is on. Once we hit negative anything, negative 55 or above, boom, action potential is turned on all the way. Right, if we don't hit this, then there is none, right? On, off. So as I said, for these action potentials, how are we gonna make these take place? Is we have those voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels. It's just going to be the timing of opening these channels that is going to allow us to make our action potential. Okay, to get that, what we call the rising phase. So, rising phase is the depolarization, the steep depolarization. Okay, that's the rising phase. Think sodium, sodium influx. So, our voltage gated sodium channels are open. Right, falling phase, that is the repolarization, right? That's our falling phase. And then the after or the hyper uh, undershoot or what we call the hyper polarization phase is we go below resting membrane potential, okay? This falling phase and this rising phase are due to what ion is going to make us decrease the membrane potential. It's going to be due to open potassium channels. Okay, so just two channels involved here. 
we're going to see our sodium and our potassium channels. It's just going to be the timing of the opening and closing of these that allow us to get this sharp depolarization and this sharp repolarization with this hyperpolarization. Okay, but again, voltage-gated sodium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels. Sodium channels can allow us to depolarize. Potassium channels allow us to repolarize and hyperpolarize. Okay, because positive ions moving in with sodium, positive move on ions moving out when we have potassium channels open. All right, let's take a closer look at these two channels that are involved that are going to help uh, are going to make our action potential take place. The first is that voltage gated sodium channel. Okay, here's the voltage gated sodium channel and you can see there are and this is going to differ a little bit from the potassium channel and there are two gates that help regulate whether sodium can move through the channels or not. There is this activation gate that is closed here and this inactivation gate. Okay, we're going to see how this plays part in um, regulating the action potential, regulating the movement of ions in there, and also regulating how we move the action potential down. But we'll get into that when we get into the propagation phase of this. Okay. But the activation gates here, inactivation gate, this is the closed but capable of opening. All right, this channel is able to open. So once we hit that negative 55, the Q is negative 55. Okay, we reach negative 55, that's gonna open this activation gate. Okay, it's actually going to Q, negative 55 Qs, both the activation gate and the inactivation gate. The difference is, is that the activation gate is very fast to open where the inactivation gate, the ball and chain, is very slow to come up and plug up the pore, as we see here. The Q is the same, threshold. We reach threshold, one's very quick, one is slow. And by slow, I'm talking milliseconds, okay? So we hit negative 55, boom, the activation gate opens. And what happens? All our sodium rushes in. And if we're recording our action potential, if the sodium, all these lots and lots of voltage-gated sodium channels open up, what's going to happen to our membrane potential? We're at rest, but now we're going to shoot up. All right. After that fast activation gate opens, that slower inactivation gate comes up and plugs up the hole. Okay, now sodium cannot cut in, so we stop this depolarization, All right? Actually, let me draw it here in a clearer. We get the depolarization, but then once sodium stops, we're not rushing in, so we're not rushing up even higher because now this inactivation gate is in play. Okay, I do want to make a notice of the difference between this state and this state here. They both don't allow sodium in. The closed but capable opening is different from the closed or the inactivated state. This channel cannot open again. All right, even if we're at negative 55, we cannot, or above it, we cannot open this channel. It has, these channels have to be reset back to this state before they can open again all right and that takes some time to reset from here back to there okay so just going through again we hit negative 55 we hit threshold boom activation gate opens sodium rushes in and activation gate comes up stops the rush of sodium in all right that's the part that sodium channels play in our action potential that allows us to get this large depolarization, okay, that's this state here, and then stopping from going up even higher is the 
effect of the slower inactivation gate coming in and plugging up the channel. Okay. All right, so here's the second player, our voltage-gated potassium channels, much simpler than the, or a little bit simpler than the sodium channels, and there's just one gate to open. And so these channels, the sodium channels, the potassium channels, they are starting at the axon HELOC and running all the way down the axon. So they are intermixed together. It's not just a section of sodium, section of, they're all on the membrane together in the same regions okay so they're going to be cued by the same thing they're going to be cued by threshold to open All right the difference between this gate and that of the sodium is this is delayed in opening the Q is still negative 55 millivolts it's just that say this is sodium channel activation gate and here is the potassium channel activation gate we hit negative 55 boom sodium opens and now potassium opens okay it is slower you can think of what was slow on the sodium channel is that inactivation gate okay you can think of it same what happens we hit negative 55 boom sodium gate opens now sodium inactivation gates coming in and plugging up about the same time that our potassium channel is starting to open all right the cues are the same it's just how fast these channels or in these gates or these uh, inactivation gates are coming into play all right it's just the timing of them this is delayed and we're going to see that voltage gated potassium channels are slow to open they are also slow to close, and that's going to help make our, remember our, okay, we reached our peak, our sodium channel, boom, activation gate opens quickly. About peak, that inactivation gate comes into play, and just about as that inactivation gate is coming into play for the sodium channels, our potassium channels are, our slow potassium channels are starting to open. And now we're getting that repolarization. Remember, they are slow to close, though. So we actually rush past membrane potential, resting membrane potential, and get that hyperpolarization. So that hyperpolarization is due to these being slow to close. Okay, so that is just this little symphony of opening and closing of these voltage gated channels all the way down the axon in an unmyelinated axon we're going to have channels all the way down the axon we'll see it in myelinated they're only going to be in those little gaps between the myelins okay but it is this opening and closing of these channels to cause our action potential here all right, so we'll look at this timing and how it works to, in a little more detail on better pictures than Professor Huss is here, and get you situated on how this timing and how change, opening these channels changes the permeability to these ions to give us our electrical signal. So let's go ahead and walk through what's taking place here in our action potential. So we start, yeah, let me get a different color here. We're starting at resting membrane potential, negative 70 millivolts. Okay, and we have those, those graded potentials. The graded potentials are what reach us to threshold. Say we're recording at, let's record at the actual axon HELOC there. Okay, and Graded potentials get us to threshold. Okay, there's the first part of the equation or part of our action potential. Once we reach threshold, what is the first thing to happen or what is the fastest thing to happen? Because threshold activates the activation gate on the sodium channels, the inactivation gate, and the gates on the potassium channel. Just has to do with the timing. Which one's fast, which one's slow? 
in our case what's fast is that activation gate on the sodium channel opens very quickly once that opens the sodium can rush in bringing its positive charge and therefore that is why we get this very rapid depolarization okay our threshold activates those inactivation gates but they're slow right about here okay those sodium channels are they say close here let's just i'll use the term inactive okay because remember inactivated channels cannot be open right away because this is going to come into account when we talk talking start talking absolute refractory periods okay so boom activation channels open sodium very rapidly sodium rushes in inactivation gates are coming into play at the peak here and around the same time that that is taking place the potassium gates are starting to open and now potassium is rushing out taking with it its positive charge and bringing the repolarizing causing repolarization okay and those potassium channels are slow to close and therefore we get that hyper after hyperpolarization okay, or the undershoot in where the potassium channels are not closed once we're closed we're back again sodium potassium pumps pumping the ions out the ions are leaking in right with more potassium leaking out and sodium leaking in and therefore we stay around our negative our resting membrane potential okay so that all that's all that's taking boom sodium in shut sodium off as potassium is starting to open up and potassium starting to leave and therefore bringing the repolarization the falling phase okay rising phase sodium coming in falling phase potassium leaving the after polarization hyperpolarization is from the slow closing potassium gates all right so that is how we run through that is how we get our action potential okay remember this is happening it's going to start at the action helox but we have these sodium and potassium channels all the way down the axon and so this is going to be taking place again and again and again it's just going to be re-upping each time we go down so we're going to talk about that and how that takes place in a moment here but let's uh walk through let's just walk through as we see what's changing place with the sodium so the yellow is the sodium permeability and purple is the potassium permeability and this is the voltage this is the dotted line is the actual action potential what we see in the membrane potential but you can see the change right the yellow sodium gates are open and therefore sodium permeability ion permeability here is up and that's what's causing our depolarization as we inactivation gates come into play more and more come into play sodium levels drop but as those inactivation gates are coming into play here that is when our potassium channels are starting to open and therefore there is the potassium permeability and you can see we get the repolarization okay so it's just a changing of ion permeability sodium first then potassium all right i just want to rehash this a little bit as we move into what's called the absolute refractory periods of and what we're going to be talking about on the next slides but what i want to rehash here is i want to rehash the difference between this state of the sodium channel and this state of the sodium channel okay this state the reset where the activation gate is play the inactivation gate is not there the channel is not inactivated it is just closed it is capable of opening so if we hit threshold this will open Okay. the difference is is when the channel is inactivated when the inactivation gate is in play 
Okay, after the activation gate's open, that comes into play. This cannot open. The channel cannot be open, even if I'm at negative 55 millivolts. All right, this isn't going to pop this out and the channel comes open again. We have to reset. We have to reset back to this configuration before the sodium channels can open again. All right, and this takes time. It's not, we're talking milliseconds, but again, this takes time. This doesn't happen. So we have a short period in which the sodium channels cannot open. And that's going to take and affect our absolute refractory periods. Okay, or at least our, our so what is a refractory period? There are two refractory periods. There's one called absolute and one called relative. And this is going to affect whether we can have an action potential or not. Or if we may need something different for an action potential to take place. All right, in the relative. In the absolute refractory period, okay, no second stimulus can produce a second action potential. Okay. You can see here, right after, through this period here, it's called the absolute refractory period. Right In this period, even if, in the absolute refractory period, even if the membrane potential, I shock, say I shock the neuron with the stimulus that is above threshold, I cannot get an action potential to take place because through this period here, what has happened? Remember my sodium activation gates have opened and now my inactivation gates are in play. This is the period in which those sodium channels are beginning to reset. Until they are reset, I cannot have a second action potential. So that is the cause of the absolute refractory period is the sodium channels are not reset. I can't open them. So if I can't open the sodium channels, I can't have sodium rush in and I can't have my depolarization, my action potential. Okay. The other period is the relative refractory period. This brown portion here. Here is now the channels are reset. Okay, the channels are reset so I can have a second action potential, but what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to have a larger action potential, or sorry, a larger stimulus. I'm gonna have to have a larger stimulus, such as we see here, Compared to this, this is the stimulus strength. This is stimulus strength here. I have to have a larger stimulus to get us to get a second action potential. Okay, and let's. Okay, so just kind of the reasoning why absolute refractory period. Okay, because the sodium channels have not been reset to the resting position. They cannot open, I cannot have an action potential. So that is the reasoning for the absolute refractory period. Okay, the relative refractory period, the channels are now reset, right? At least enough of the channels have been reset where I can have them open and I can have an action potential. The other key for the relative, because what had to happen? I had to have a bigger stimulus. My channels, sodium channels are reset but what's still open during the re relative refractory period? The potassium channels are still open. All right, so let's look at, remember our action potential happens this way, boom. And I have that period in which I'm below All right, here's where my that after hyperpolarization is where my potassium channels are still open. Those slow channels are slow to close, All right? My initial stimulus to get an action potential was, I had to go from here to here, negative 70 to negative 55. Is my membrane potential at resting here? No, in the, when the potassium channels are slow to close and I'm still in that 
hyperpolarization, that after hyperpolarization, it's below resting membrane potential. So again, to get the threshold though, I have to, to get an action potential, I have to get to negative 55. In this case, you can see this stimulus to get to there is much larger than this one. So in the relative, I have to have this larger stimulus to get a second action potential. Okay, and that's because those sodium channels are still open and I'm below resting membrane potential here. All right, so this slide's really good and it shows kind of here is that absolute refractory period. Here's a relative refractory period in this time frame. And it's nice because it shows you the state of the channels up at the top here with the sodium. All right, so let's just take a whole look and look at relate this to our relative refractory period, but we can also look at it's a good one to just look at what's taking place with the action potential. Okay, so here both channels are closed. We're at resting membrane potential, right? Those Graded potentials get us up to threshold. And what happens at threshold? The first thing to happen is the sodium channels open. And that's where we get our rush of sodium. Okay, boom. Sodium's rushing up. All right, what happens here is now our sodium channels are inactivated. And what's happening when our sodium channels are inactivated? Our slower potassium channels start to open, and therefore we get this conductance. The permeability of potassium increases as the permeability of sodium is decreasing, and therefore we get the repolarization. All right. Sodium channels are slow to close. They're still open all the way through here until we get to the end. But remember, what is the state? Look at our relative our absolute refractory period. Our state of our channels are, our sodium channels are inactivated. So I cannot have a second action potential because I can't open those channels. But in the relative, you can see the channels are starting to reset. These channels can be open, and so I can have a second action potential. The problem is, even though these sodium channels are reset, our potassium channels are still open. I'm below resting membrane potential here, and so I have to have I have to make up this gap. The yellow is our regular is our resting membrane potential. There's a gap here between where my membrane potential is and resting. So I have to basically I have to make up the difference between here and here on my stimulus. My stimulus has to be this much larger than the stimulus I had to have here to get me up to threshold, All right? So relative, I can have an action potential because these are beginning to reset. Problem is I have to have a bigger stimulus since the potassium channels are still open. And then relative, absolute, ref, rel, or absolute refractory period cannot have a, because my channels are in, sodium channels are in this state and cannot be open all right this is going to become these refractory period we'll see are going to be important when we start talking about how we move the action potential down the axon and we want to move it in one direction and that's going to be important with these absolute refractory periods okay so we got the action potential down we get it started at the axon HELOC, that's when we have those first stretch of sodium and potassium, voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels, but we have, in an unmyelinated axon, we have those channels on the membrane all the way down the axon. And so this is why we don't lose signal, is because we're gonna be opening up these channels all the way down the membrane and so we have this re-upping of the signal along the whole membrane and therefore we don't lose the signal so once we start the action potential we can bring it all the way down the axon all right 
And you see this takes place in what we call propagation, propagating the action potential down the axon. Okay, and how does this take place? It doesn't, basically we're re-upping the signal every step of the way. We're opening up sodium channels here and then opening them here and here, 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 all the way down the axon. Okay. So here we're going to look at propagation. So how do we move this action potential down the axon? And how do we keep it going in just one direction? We don't want the action potential going down the axon and then back up. So how do we do this? Well, how do we open the channels all the way down is, we can see if this is say the axon HELOC here, that's the first stretch of channels. And we're just showing one channel, but you can imagine the membrane is surrounded with a bunch of bunch of channels and we have these different stretches of the axon. Okay, next stretch, next stretch, next stretch, next stretch of the axon. Okay, remember our graded potentials that open up this channel. If there was no opening of this channel, it might not make it down to threshold for these other channels. So this is key in that the propagation shows us that the opening of this channel, this stretch of channels, the ions coming in, remember our action, what's our membrane potential? It's going up to positive 30. So we're definitely getting past threshold. So the opening of the stretch of these channels cues the opening of the next stretch. The opening of this stretch cues the opening of the next stretch and boom, 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 boom. We're just re-upping the channel or re-upping re the signal all the way down. So that is why when I measure here, my action potential is like this. And I measure here because each stretch of the membrane, I'm opening up a new set of sodium channels to give us our action potential. Okay. Now, why do I, or why does it go in just one direction? <laughs> okay. Let's go back. Remember our absolute, what's happening in our absolute refractory period? Our sodium channels are inactivated. Okay. Remember, fast to open, activation gate, then the sodium channels come in or sorry, the inactivation gate comes in and closes off the sodium channel. Okay, if this channel cues the opening of this channel, this has to open first to cue the opening of the activation gate here. As this activation gate is opening on these stretch of channels, the channels behind them are in the inactivated state. These can't be open. I can't do an action potential. Therefore, I can't open these channels. I can't go in this direction. I can only open channels further down the line. When this, this, so this channel cues the opening of this channel. When these stretch of channels are open, the ones behind are inactive. And therefore, I can't open those ones behind me. I can only open the ones further down the axon. And so that is what keeps us going unidirectional, keeps us going in one direction. We can't go backwards, okay? Because these channels are inactive. The ones behind are inactive and therefore I can't send the signal in the reverse direction, okay? This propagation of action, how fast this occurs, there are some things that can change the rate at which this speed of sending this action potential down the axon. Okay, two main factors are diameter of the axon. If we have a larger diameter axon, there is less resistance, I can move the current much quicker, and therefore I can have a faster action potential. Um, some of the early studies, they use the giant squid axon, you can actually see the axon itself visually with your naked eye and so you can imagine if you've ever seen a squid how fast boom they move super fast when they respond 
They're using that giant squid action where we can, it's a very large axon. Most of our axons, we have to use a microscope to see, but you can see this giant squid axon with the naked eye, and it is a very rapid signal through that giant squid axon. Okay, so that's diameter. Temperature, we keep our temperature rather constant. Okay, when we're exercising, we raise our temperature, we're actually able to kind of move our muscles faster once we exercise. That's one of the factors. Is temperature but the two main factors we're looking at is diameter and the other is going to be myelination okay remember our oligodendrocytes in our central nervous system and our schwann cells in our uh in our uh, peripheral nervous system they are those insulation kind of like that electrical tape around the axons they are going to speed up the rate at which we can send an action potential. All right, so if I have a very thick diameter axon and it's highly myelinated, I'm gonna have a very quick signal. So when I have to go over, remember these neurons are sometimes talking over three feet of length, okay? These axons can be three feet of length. I need to get a signal through there rapidly. So I better have some myelination and Hopefully it's a little bit bigger than some of the other axons, so I can get that signal down very, very quickly. All right, so myelination. There's that giant squid axon, all right, just under a millimeter, so you can actually see it with the physical eye, but you can see how thick this is. Here's all our little dots, our little axons. You see how, boom, that axon is just very, very rapid. So let's look at why myelination increases the conduction, the rate at which I can send the action potential down. Okay, you can see the myelination here. Boom, there's myelin, but it's not a continuous state there are gaps in between the myelin called the nodes of Ranvier. and what do you think you might find in these nodes of Ranvier? okay on an unmyelinated axon we have unmyelinated axons they're not as fast as say the myelinated but unmyelinated axons all right we have sodium and potassium channels all the way on the membrane all the way down the axon all lengths of it in our myelinated axons we have those channels just exist here in the nodes of Ranvier. we don't have to have them on underneath this myelin the myelin is insulating that electrical signal okay if you think in our continuous signaling that's where we have no myelin and we have sodium and potassium voltage gated sodium potassium channels all the way down the axons we have to re-up every length of the membrane of the axon we have to re-up the signal in our myelinated axons we only have to re-up at the gaps here so our signal can skip boom skip boom skip boom so it is a much faster rate at which we can send the signal because we can skip we don't have to re-up all the way we only have to re-up in these nodes around the a gap okay why can we do this is because remember our graded potentials they leak signal all right they leak signal so if we have insulation though we're not leaking the signal we can keep that signal strong strong enough to get us to threshold at each of these gaps to open up those new set of channels and so because we're not leaking the thing and leaking the current we can skip over and we can just open the channels at the nodes okay so open channel here current moves down here it's insulated so it's still going to be strong enough to open the channels here, if we didn't have the insulation and we didn't have channels here, we could leak current and we may not reach threshold at the next node of Ranvier, where the next set of channels are at. 
Okay, so this keeps that current strong enough to be able to get us the threshold at each node. And so we're able to skip, boom, boom, boom. It is much faster rate of conduction down the axon. Here's that, our channels, right? We open up our channels, we have the rush of sodium, boom, changing the membrane potential, we move down here. All right, we're still at threshold, so we open up these next sets that are in the node. If this myelin didn't exist and I had this gap in channels, by the time I reach here, there might be enough leakage of current that I couldn't reach threshold here and I wouldn't be able to open these channels and the conduction would stop down the axon. Okay, this mode of conduction down a myelinated axon is called saltatory conduction. That is when I'm using myelin and I have these nodes around VA. Otherwise it's called continuous because I have to continually open channels when I don't have the myelin there. Okay. This is important with those really small axons because remember diameter changes. It makes it slower if I have a small diameter. So many of my small diameter axons, I definitely want to have a myelinated. Otherwise, the ability to conduct down them may be rather slow. Okay, slow in a sense of an or a action potential not slow and running slow okay so let's let's look at a some diseases called demyelinating diseases rather bad diseases and you can imagine right because here is our myelin where our myelin should be some diseases are we have like Gillian Barr, the immune system goes and attacks your myelin, right? Remember, our neurons are not making channels. Our channels are not inserted under the myelin. Okay, so once here we can open up the channels, we're at threshold. But now the myelin's gone. There's no channels here, so I'm not re-upping the signal on it like a continuous where the channels opening here will open up these channels. Channels opening here will open these channels. Now the current is leaking out. And by the time I reach here, I'm below threshold. I cannot open these channels. If I can't open these channels, I can't continue the signal, and I lose my action potential so I lose the ability to signal okay many of your large or your long uh, motor neurons are myelinated highly myelinated so using muscles are gonna be take walking gets lost because those right loss of vision so you can imagine what neurons what sensory neurons are gonna be myelinated yeah your visual ones Okay, so when you lose that myelin, you lose the ability to signal in many of the neurons that must have myelin to send their action potentials. Okay, pretty devastating disease in that you're losing a lot of your neural signaling. All right, so let's get into how, um, how stimulus is how different stimuluses are coded because remember our action potential an action potential the strength is and the amplitude is the same so when i'm touching my skin very gently okay a small stimulus compared to when i'm pressing down with a strong stimulus my brain is able to distinguish between this gentle and the hard pressure Okay, the stimuluses are bigger. But the stimuluses can't change the size of the action potential in that sensory neuron that's firing. Sensory neuron's gonna fire, send an action potential up to my brain, all right, and tell me what's going on. 
but if I can't change the amplitude, how does my brain determine, hey, the difference between a gentle and a strong signal? All right, here's gentle stimulus, strong stimulus. And here are my action potentials I'm recording. Okay, you can see the amplitude of these action potentials. Each of these dots is an action potential. The amplitude is the same. What do you see changing between my gentle and my strong stimulus? The strong stimulus causes that neuron to send a more frequent signaling of action potentials. Boom, 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 boom. Action potential, action potential, action potential. Where up here with the gentle, it's action potential, action potential, action potential. And this is the signals that the brain, those regions that integrate the sensory signals for, say, touch, are getting. My brain can put codes to these. Hey, I'm getting high frequency. This is this is a strong signal. Oh, I'm getting just medium frequency. This or very small change in frequency. This is a gentle signal. So my brain can interpret these frequencies of action potentials to give me what the sense is. Okay. We'll relate this to you can see the neurotransmitter release. We're going headed in this direction. You can see the Less frequent is releasing less neurotransmitter than the high frequency. Okay, and we'll get how, we'll look now at how this neurotransmitter is released. Okay, but just to code, how do we code for the intensity of the stimulus? It has to do with how frequent the neuron is sending an action potential. Okay, that is how we can code for it. All right, so once we get that action potential down the axon, we end up heading towards those axon terminals. Remember the axon branches out to those little axon terminals, those little bulbs at the end, the synaptic bulbs, and that is where we're gonna change this electrical signal, and most neurons, we're gonna change it to a chemical signal at the chemical synapse. All right, so we're gonna release the neurotransmitter, the signal molecules, onto a re target cell receptor. Okay, so we have the axon terminal is a presynaptic cell. All right, before the synapse, there's so at these chemical synapses, there is a space that is the synapse. They don't physically touch each other in the chemical synapse. We'll see electrically there is a connection but we're gonna focus mainly on these chemical synapses. All right, the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. Now the postsynaptic cell can be many different cells. It can be a neuron, of course. It can be muscle, it can be glands, just depends on what the presynaptic neuron is targeting. Okay, so in the next slides, we'll look at the electrical synapses but for the most part, we're going to be focusing on the chemical synapses and focusing on the neurotransmitters and the neurotransmitter receptors to look at different signaling that will take place in what these neurotransmitters, basically the functions in the nervous system. So here's kind of the two synapses looking visually with the electrical synapse. Again, we're just gonna spend a short amount of time on these, just one slide. Most of our time is gonna be sent, spent here looking at chemical synapses and looking at the neurotransmitters and the receptors for those neurotransmitters. Okay, but let's first take a brief look at the electrical synapse and then we'll move on to the chemical. All right, if you remember, we've already seen this in our cell signaling in that the electrical synapses are formed by these connexin proteins, making these gap junctions. Basically, it's a tunnel between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. 
right? And what can happen is we can get flow of direction through the gap junctions. If there's an action potential coming down here, it can be sent into the neighboring cell, okay? So we flow through that synapse and we can flow in both directions, okay? So there can be communication in both directions, in this case with the electrical synapse, all right? But there's actually a physical coupling with these connection proteins. Remember the chemical synapse, there is, they come very close together, but there still is that synaptic cleft in between them, that small space in between the synapses or between the postsynaptic cell and the presynaptic cell and the chemical synapse, All right? So that's where we're headed. We're headed to the chemical synapse. Um, we're not gonna see a lot of this electrical synapse in the neurons, we're not going to take, there are neurons that operate through electrical synapses, but the bulk is going to be chemical synapse. Where we're going to see much of the gap junctions is when we're looking at the cardiac and some of the smooth muscle. But we'll spend a good amount of time with the cardiac cells in gap junction. All right, so our chemical synapse. Chemical synapse, we got the axon terminal coming in, right, with the bulb, synaptic bulb. And again, there's no physical connection here. There is a space, the synaptic cleft in between. That is where the neurotransmitter is going to get released. And then on our postsynaptic cell, this one is a neuron, but our postsynaptic cell, again, can be muscle can be many different tissues, but the key is, is that where these synapses, there should be receptors on the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. Okay. So here is that chemical synapse. And what you'll see, the action potential, right, is running down, it will be running that electrical signals running down into the axon terminal. What we're going to see in most axon terminals is we're going to have neurotrans vesicles with neurotransmitter in them. And what the cue, the action potential's cue, is to turn that electrical signal coming down is going to change into the release of this neurotransmitter, therefore creating this chemical signal and this chemical cell signaling between the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic cell which has those receptors okay and depending on what receptors are here it depends on what response will be taking place in this postsynaptic cell okay so let's see how we cue how that we turn the action potential into the release into this release of this chemical messenger. All right, so our action potential is coming down. We have a change of membrane potential. Action potential runs down into the axon terminal. Now we have a new set of voltage gated channels. We have the voltage gated calcium channels here that action potential coming down to the axon terminal is going to open up those voltage gated calcium channels and calcium is high outside compared to inside so therefore calcium is going to rush in why is this important because calcium is the cue to trigger exocytosis it's going to trigger these vesicles to dock and then fuse with the membrane here and cause exocytosis of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft all right the neurotransmitter on the postsynaptic cell should be receptor for that neurotransmitter the neurotransmitter binds and then we get a response in the postsynaptic cell.
Okay, so we get our cell signaling, we get our cell to cell communication, right? It's all cued by the action potential. The action potential is a cue is saying, hey, let's communicate with the postsynaptic cell here. Okay, so again, walking through, action potential comes down, cues the voltage gated calcium channels, the calcium rushes in, it's going to basically activate these snare proteins that cause the docking of these vesicles and the fusion and exocytosis of the neurotransmitter binding to the receptor and causing a response in the postsynaptic cell. Okay, but again, those snare complexes, those are what get activated by this calcium influx. They are going to be the ones that help tether the vesicles here and cause the release of neurotransmitter. All right, here's a closer look at these snare proteins. We got, you don't need to know names, synaptotaxin, synaptobrevin, that's here on the vesicle. And then at the postsynaptic cell, you have these SNAP25 syn syntaxin, all right? But basically, the calcium cues the activation to cause these proteins to cause the docking of the vesicle and ultimately the release and exocytosis of the neurotransmitter. Okay, without these snare proteins, we can't get docking, we can't get release of neurotransmitter. Common drug, probably some of you know about, Botox, is basically a toxin. All right, and it basically goes in, they inject it into regions of the forehead. Say your professor's got lines here, we would inject it into my little lines here from over the years and what does that do it digests the snare proteins in those acetylcholine neurons okay acetylcholines needed to cause muscles to contract if my muscles can't track contract i can't furrow my brows and therefore i have a nice i'd have a nice clean line up here right so that is what that botox is doing is basically cleaving these snares up and if I cleave those up, I can't dock, I can't release the neurotransmitter to contract my muscles and my muscles don't contract and my forehead stays nice and smooth. I don't get those furrow brows in here. Okay, so we got to have those snares proteins to come down to dock so we get exocytosis. And those are what are being activated when we get that influx of calcium. Since we're moving into cell signaling, let's just do a little review of uh, some of the signaling uh, receptors that we've looked at. We've looked at ligand-gated ion channels. Right? That's just opening of a channel. Right? And then we have our G protein couple receptors where we can have multiple effects. They can open up ion channels, they can uh, do second messenger system, depending on what receptor it is, depends on what path or what takes place in the target tissue. So I want you to keep that in mind that the receptor determines on what effect there will be at the target tissue, because there are, we can have one neurotransmitter and it can bind a ligand gated ion channel, or that neurotransmitter can also bind a G protein couple receptor. There are multiple receptors for these neurotransmitters and depending on what receptor there depends on what response happens in the target cell. Okay, so keep that in mind because the first one we're looking at, first neurotransmitter is acetylcholine and we're gonna see that there are ligand gated ion channels and there are G protein couple receptors for that same neurotransmitter. So our first neurotransmitter, we'll look at acetylcholine or ACH. Okay. Neurons that release acetylcholine or receptors that bind acetylcholine, you'll be hear them termed as cholinergic. Okay, cholinergic neuron, cholinergic receptor, 
But acetylcholine is basically a combination of acetyl-CoA combined with choline. Right? There's an enzyme in the neuron that puts it together and then it gets housed in the vesicles. Okay? Once we get a action potential coming in, that will cue the release of acetylcholine. All right, once released, binds to the cholinergic receptor, All right? And the key is, is these neurotransmitters that get re released in the synaptic cleft, you can think of this, this is actually interstitial fluid here. It is a very small region, okay? Very small space in between, so most of the acetylcholine that gets released will be able to bind to receptors, but some will diffuse out. But remember the neurotransmitters, uh, or the neuron signaling is very okay localized and it is very quick so we get the signal but then it gets taken away so we have to diffuse we don't want this acetylcholine constantly bombarding and activating the receptor we need to remove the signal and the way it's done for acetylcholine is there's acetylcholinesterase okay an enzyme here that breaks down okay acetylcholine to choline and acetate. That choline can get recycled back into the presynaptic neuron and be put together to make acetylcholine again. All right, so this response, look at here. So let's first look at acetylcholine signaling at a ligand-gated ion channel. Um, this, one of the places this takes place is the neuromuscular junction. Right. These are the neurons that talk to the skeletal muscles to cause them to contract. Okay, so we'll look at this. We'll look at the signaling, but the receptor here is called a nicotinic receptor. All right, nicotinic in that it is a ligand-gated ion channel. The bulk of the ion that's going to be let through is sodium. Okay, sodium is allowed to move through and that will cause depolarization. So we're gonna see that it causes depolarization of the muscle here. But let's walk through, coming through, just since we've just done release of neurotransmitters, we have the action potential coming in. All right, what's the action potential Q? It cues the opening of those voltage-gated sodium channels. And why is that important? Okay, because the voltage-gated sodium channel is going to result in the docking of the vesicles that contain the acetylcholine all right, and cause them to be exocytosed, released into the synapse. Those acetylcholine molecules will come down and bind to the receptor. And again, that receptor is a nicotinic receptor, and it's a ligand-gated ion channel for sodium. Okay, what's that going to do? It's going to cause sodium to rush in, and we're going to get depolarization of the muscle cell. That depolarization ultimately is going to lead to the contraction of the muscle. Okay, so that's one receptor for the acetylcholine. And remember, whatever receptor is on the target tissue depends on what response the target cell is going to have. In this case, we're ligand-gated ion channel. We're just going to depolarize in the ion sodium. We're going to depolarize the cell. That's the effect that the neurotransmitter is going to have. All right, the next, muscarinic. Muscarinic is a mushroom derivative and it binds to the same receptor that acetylcholine would bind, hence it gets the name muscarinic. But in this case, instead of being a ligand-gated ion channel, we have a G-protein coupled receptor. Okay, muscarinics are G-protein coupled receptors, but what it, the same neurotransmitter is binding to the muscarinic as the nicotinic. It's just we're going to have because there is a different receptor, we're going to have a different ref different effect at the target tissue. You can see some of these. And remember, G-proteins can have multiple effects. 
what we see is muscarinic receptor. There are actually multiple subtypes of muscarinic receptor. So not all muscarinic receptors are going to have the same response at the target tissue. Binding or binding of the muscarinic receptor is not going to have the same response at the target tissue. Okay, we can see some cells we get hyperpolarization because we're opening in potassium channels. All right, this is one subtype of muscarinic receptor where this other subtype actually closes the potassium channels and opens a sodium or calcium channel. Also, these G proteins can act through um, other messenger systems or activate other proteins. So there are multiple effects that we can have at uh, the different target tissue, okay? being that they are G protein couple receptors. But again, it is the same neurotransmitter that bound the nicotinic, binds the muscarinic, but we get a different effect at cells because there is a different receptor there that is binding. Okay, so just trying to hammer it home. It is the receptor that determines what's going to happen, what the response is going to be at the target tissue. All right, so deactivation of acetylcholine. We already saw a bit of this in that there are acetylcholinesterase is a enzyme that is on. You can see it is embedded in the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. And what does that do? It cleaves the acetylcholine molecule into acetate and choline. Okay, because our muscles, we want our muscles to be able to contract we need them to contract but we don't want them to stay contracted unless we actually want to keep putting in all right i want to keep it contracted but many times we want the muscles to contract but then relax if we don't get rid of that signal from acetylcholine we're going to stay contracted okay so we got to get rid of the signal and for acetylcholine we have this acetylcholinesterase enzyme here that will break down acetylcholine and what we see is the acetate and the choline can be brought back in to be reused to make acetylcholine again at the presynaptic neuron okay so we don't want a continuous signal here so we got ways we're going to see other neurotransmitters there's different ways to do this but for acetylcholine we can cleave it in by using acetylcholinesterase All right, so the next class, we got our monoamine neurotransmitter, and we actually get several neurotransmitters from here, and that you can see in this case, tyrosine is the building block. We're going to see we can build from tryptophan or histidine, but again, these are both amines. They are amino acids that are the precursor to the actual neurotransmitter. Okay, for tyrosine, we can get the neurotransmitter dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. These all have very similar structure because we're just changing one part of the molecule. Okay, but we get dopamine, and we're going to see we'll also look at serotonin that is derived from the amino acid L-tryptophan. Okay, so first our serotonin, L-tryptophan, you can see there are pathways, there are different regions that involve different neurotransmitters, our predominant neurotransmitter. The raphide nucleus is one of those, has a high density of neurons that secrete serotonin. Serotonin, many of you might have heard of serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that increase the activity of serotonin in the brain. Many of those are used as um, antidepressants, okay, because serotonin is involved in regulation of mood, appetite, and cerebral circulation, 
the one that's well known for is that relate regulation of mood many of the antidepressant drugs work on increasing levels of serotonin in the brain okay. our monomine receptors okay. they are going to use G protein couple receptors acting through second messenger systems hopefully this looks familiar from your cell cell uh, signaling days All right we activate that adenylate cyclase enzyme okay activates protein kinase and we can get actions downstream from the activation of that cyclic amp okay so your monoamines are going to act through a g protein couple receptor The next dopamine. So two major pathways in some of these. We have the nigro striatal, the substantia nigra. Right, we're going to see involved in movement. Okay. Parkinson's a d disease of movement, right? You get the shakiness, and they can't initiate movement this is one of those pathways this dopamine pathway in which it seems that these cells usually these cells have died off there's less signaling through this nigro striatal pathway and therefore you get movement disorder such as we see in parkinson okay i don't know if anybody's seen the movie awakenings but it is a good movie. It talks about one of the doctors that learned, hey, this dopamine pathway learned to increase dopamine and actually increased the activity and the ability for these patients to move. Okay? And unfortunately, the, the drug doesn't last. The brain gets used to it and you lose some of those symptoms so it doesn't stay consistent. Okay. Mesolimbic pathway, this is where many of your drugs that create, um, create addiction activate this portion of the brain, the mesolimbic pathway, that is a dopamine pathway. Okay, they originate in the midbrain and to the nucleus accumbens. This is the site in which addiction, it's the reward center of the brain. So many of those drugs that are addictive, ultimately they are increasing signaling likely at the nuclear accumbens through this dopamine pathway. And that is where it gets the reinforcing, hey, I need more, I need more, because you are activating this mesolimbic symptom or system, sorry. Next in line, norepinephrine. Okay, remember we go, this is made from tyrosine. We had dopamine. Next in line would be we modify dopamine into norepinephrine, which is another neurotransmitter. Okay, much of its arousal. We're going to see we're going to use norepinephrine in the sympathetic neurons. So when we get to the autonomic, we will be moving through to norepinephrine again and you can see there are different subtypes beta and alpha and there are actually like beta 1 beta 2 so there are multiple multiple receptors and again they all bind norepinephrine but depending on what receptor will depend on what's going to take place at the target tissue So let's look at how drugs affect neurotransmission. Many of your psychiatric drug or many of your drugs work by increasing or altering the activity at these different receptors for these neurotransmitters. Okay, if you remember our agonist, an agonist is going to mimic the natural ligand. 
So say we're talking about dopamine, a dopamine agonist would mimic the effects of dopamine at whatever target tissue. It would activate the receptor and we would get the same response as you would see with dopamine. An antagonist. Okay. An antagonist is going to prevent. So I think I've used the psychiatric drug or the psychotropic drug, um, antipsychotics, where they antagonize the dopamine 2 receptor. Okay. In schizophrenia, there's hallucinations, delusions. All right. It looks like many of those are caused by overactivity at the dopamine. To specifically the dopamine 2 receptor. So we put in a dopamine 2 antagonist and we can actually start decreasing those hallucinations and delusions in those patients. Okay, because we're stopping, or not stopping, but we're dampening down or inhibiting that dopamine signaling at that receptor. Okay. Another way is inhibit the degradation. If you remember our acetylcholine, how did we break down our acetylcholine? We broke down acetylcholine with acetylcholinesterase, that enzyme. If we were to block that enzyme, what would happen? We would have increased amount of acetylcholine in the synapse, which if we have more acetylcholine, we would have more signaling at the receptor. So it, breaking it down, inhibiting, the degradation would actually increase the activity of that neurotransmitter in the brain or wherever it's operating. Okay. The other is called what we call inhibition of reuptake. Okay. We haven't seen this yet, but we saw acetylcholine. We got acetylcholinesterase, breaks it down. Serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine many of these monoamines how they are how we remove the signal at the synapse is the presynaptic neuron will the neurotransmitter gets secreted and actually the presynaptic neuron will reuptake in this case we're talking serotonin okay so we release but then the presynaptic neuron takes back that neurotransmitter, removes it from the synapse. In these drugs, we can inhibit the reuptake. So if we release the neurotransmitter, but we're inhibiting it being brought back into the presynaptic neuron, we're gonna increase the amount of serotonin out here, and we're gonna increase the activity of serotonin at the synapse, at the target tissue. Okay, many you've heard of SSRIs, possibly selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and that essentially is what those antidepressant drugs are doing. They are inhibiting the serotonin from getting reuptake, so we're increasing the amount of serotonin in here, and we're increasing the effects of serotonin at the target tissue because we will get more signaling there. Okay, so that's our ways we can alter some of these, um, the transmission or the signaling of these uh, neurotransmitters. We can increase them or we can um, antagonize and decrease the signaling, signaling of these neurotransmitters. So the last two neurotransmitters we're going to look at are glutamate and GABA. These are the most prevalent neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. Uh, glutamate is the most prevalent excitatory and GABA is the most prevalent inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, you can see glutamate um, activates many regions of the brain. So you can imagine if there's any drugs that affect signaling of glutamate, it would have a pretty drastic effect. Um, one such drug is PCP. We've heard of PCP. It is an antagonist at the NMDA receptor, receptor for glutamate. Um, the effects of PCP. PCP can almost mimic schizophrenia in all its facets 
uh, schizophrenics are most people know hallucinogenic and delusions, but the harder part to treat for schizophrenia is they are very, very low affect. They don't almost have no emotion. And PCP almost mimics it, gives you hallucinations, but also drops your affect very low. One other thing is PCP, glutamate is involved in pain signaling. So you block the glutamate, you block the pain signal, you see people with PCP. Um, if you've seen where people get handcuffed by the police and they actually pop their shoulders out to try to get the handcuffs off or break an arm, it's because they, are, they don't feel the pain. They are antagonizing it, so the brain is not getting the signal of the pain. They're still causing the damage, but the signal's not getting up that, hey, damage is taking place. So. Um, kind of the running joke was one thing you learned in this class was don't take PCP. Um, it is a very, very serious drug. All right, but let's look at one, one of the other places in which glutamate is important is in learning in this what we call long-term potentiation. Okay, and that gives us our synaptic plasticity. We can facilitate, potentiate, enhance the activity at the synapse, enhance the signaling between the presynaptic and the postsynaptic neuron, or we can depress it or inhibit, so decrease the synaptic activity. Our glutamate signaling works through potentiation. We're going to be able to enhance the signal, okay? and that is what we call long-term potentiation. We bring these changes at the synapse that increase the signaling. Okay, so much of many of your learning memory is through doing potentiation, increasing the signaling at certain synapses. All right. So we're going to look at this on the next slide. Two players in this, we have glutamate receptors. We have what's called an AMPA receptor, which is a sodium channel, allows sodium through, and an NMDA receptor. Okay, the NMDA is a little interesting in that it has it has to bind glutamate, but then there's this large magnesium ion that is blocking the channel. So we have to open the channel and also get rid of this magnesium ion so it will allow calcium as well as sodium and potassium to flow through. Okay, we're going to see this receptor only opens when bound to glutamate and the cell is depolarized. Okay, glutamate opens the channel and we're going to see the depolarization is what causes that magnesium to be injected, ejected. Okay, we will see this here in the next slide. Okay. But this signaling through this NMDA receptor makes changes at both the postsynaptic membrane. Here's a word you should know now: upregulation. Okay, we can add receptors to the postsynaptic membrane. The postsynaptic cell will also send out a paracrine signal to the presynaptic cell to enhance glutamate release. So we're doing two things here. We're increasing the receptors and also increasing the amount of glutamate release. And so this is how we're getting a stronger signal at the synapse. Okay, more neurotransmitter and more receptors to bind to, to give us a stronger response in our postsynaptic cell. So here's how it operates. Here's the presynaptic neuron with the glutamate in its vesicles. Here's the AMPA receptor. It is a sodium ligand gated sodium channel. So when glutamate binds, sodium is allowed to rush in. And what is sodium going to do? It's going to depolarize. depolarize this postsynaptic cell. 
here is that NMDA receptor. That magnesium is usually sitting there. Okay, when the cell is not depolarized. All right, but when we get glutamate release, we get binding of the AMPA, we get depolarization, we get binding of glutamate to the NMDA receptor to open the channel. But remember that magnesium is still sitting here. But where did we get depolarization? We got depolarization here. And that, if we have enough depolarization, boom, that ejects the magnesium. And now we can allow that calcium to move through here. Okay, it's going to activate second messenger pathway. This is going to increase the amount of AMPA receptors, amount of receptors here. All right, and we're also going to send that signal, that paracrine signal, to tell the have the presynaptic neuron secrete more glutamate. So now we have more receptors, more glutamate. We're going to enhance the signal, and if we keep firing this neuron. This pathway, we're going to keep potentiating. At a certain point, it's going to be very, very robust signaling. And this is how you're doing your learning. Okay. Uh, Long-term potentiation, it's through an NMDA receptor. Boom, fired. All right. I just increased the activity here. Long-term potentiation through uh, NMDA receptor. Fired this neuron again. All right. And so this is how, this is why... You shouldn't be just cramming at the end because you're not able to fire those circuits in which you're learning and you're not getting that potentiation. So also when you're cramming, what's wrong? You usually forget it right afterwards. Okay. Whereas if you study over longer periods of time and you've used this circuit many times, you've potentiated it and you typically will retain that information. So that is how you are essentially one of the components of learning is doing this long-term potentiation. So the last neurotransmitter we'll look at is GABA. Gamma aminobutric acid and glycine is another. These are, um, these are inhibitory neurotransmitter it is the most prevalent okay they are chemically gated chloride channels remember chloride is outside higher outside than inside so when a chloride channel opens we haven't looked at chloride yet chloride is going to rush in different from sodium and potassium in that chloride is a negative ion so if i'm bringing negative ions in what am i doing to my memory potential I'm bringing it down. So I'm inhibiting. Here's where we get those inhibitory signals, right? Our inhibitory graded signals could come from GABA channels opening. Okay. Many, there are many um, drugs that work on GABA. Your sleep medicines, usually there are certain GABA receptor subtype that they're agonist to. All right, benzodiazepines, like Valium, what do they do? They depress, they relax you, they calm you down so you don't get as riled. Um, they are agonists at these GABA, so they're inhibiting the brain activity, and therefore you're not getting as fired up. Okay, so that is...